Nicholas Hamid, and here is you on the Tutabal co-founder of Place Telegram, and our guest, uh, Zaki Malian, uh, who is uh, co-founder of uh, Sommelier Finance. It's a uh, uh, decentralized uh, software for automated portfolio uh, management with risk uh, mitigation, as well as he's a uh, big uh, contributor to Cosmos and Tendermint ecosystems, and uh, he's generally jack of all trades. He uh, uh, is as well co-founder of my exclusion, uh, the uh, validator for different uh, blockchains and ecosystems. Great to have you here, Zaki. It's great to be here. So can you tell us about your background and when and how did you get into the blockchain industry? Yeah, I've told the story many times. Uh, late 2013, um, I had become very interested in cryptography and distributed systems, uh, security, privacy, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, contributed to Signal, Tor, learned about this Bitcoin thing. It was like, how does this all work? Mm -hmm. Want to understand this stuff better? So started figuring it out. Uh, went really deep into, like, cryptography and distributed systems. Started contributing to Tendermint. Um, started, you know, had an enterprise blockchain company that and was kept contributing to Cosmos. Um, helped launch the Cosmos network in 2018, 2019. Helped launch IBC. Then launched IBC, finished IBC, and launched in 2021. Uh, in 2021, uh, started Sommelier shortly thereafter in 2021. Um, just like passionate about building distributed systems, blockchain protocols, uh, DeFi are the things that I like. So what was your first impression when you discovered Bitcoin and blockchain technology? <sighs> I wasn't really, I didn't, you know, it's, there's like the tech side of crypto and there's the money side of crypto. Mm -hmm. I think at this point I appreciate them both, uh, but probably didn't really understand the money side of crypto mm -hmm. in the early days, um, but really found, okay, this is a really fascinating technology, right? Um, so mostly approached it from like the technology protocol design lens mm -hmm. um, and then started to appreciate the other aspects of it later. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I think, you know, Bitcoin is a, was an extremely inspiring system. It provided a lot of entry for like many, for everybody who was in the space. So we all used to just be part of the Bitcoin community. Mm -hmm. And why did you decide to get in, into a Cosmos ecosystem and build your project on Cosmos? So, ecosystem? my feeling was that what we, there are two things that I, I've kind of felt for a long time. One was the, L, the generalized L1 narrative um, where like you have one blockchain, it serves a lot of different applications and users. Um, I've always felt that that narrative was not going to be the way for mass adoption. That if you really wanted to have blockchains that were driving 100 million user apps, that you needed to have application specific blockchains. I also felt like what we needed was more of an interoperable innovation marketplace, mm -hmm. right? Where people, entrepreneurs, engineers, researchers could propose new blockchain systems, but rather than having to like bootstrap everything from scratch, you could build a new blockchain and then immediately get access to an existing user base, existing liquidity, et cetera. And Cosmos was the first network that like sort of enabled that kind of a system. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think it's the most mature of that kind of system, but now you see everything else in blockchain building a similar marketplace. Uh, what are your thoughts about Polkadot when it's all people and those are chains? Um, okay, so I think Polkadot, I think like my overall, I think Polkadot is a very good and interesting system. Um, I think there are a couple of things that I would observe about Polkadot that are challenges, right? Um, you know, Polkadot is this weird hybrid of a system that, you know, so like the Cosmos journey was, Cosmos SDK comes out. Mm -hmm. We actually got some large users of the Cosmos SDK early on. Um, both uh, like Polygon, which was EVM centric, um, uh, Polygon, Binance, BNB chain, and Terra, right? Those were kind of our three big external users outside of the, the core Cosmos network, like around like Cosmos itself. And we had this initial success where IBC launched and 
Osmosis launched, and then Osmosis, Terra, like Cosmos, the Cosmos Hub, Osmosis, and Terra were all connected. <laughs> and for, you know, even the collapse of Terra really drove a lot of maturity around the system, like mm -hmm. billions and billions of dollars moved through the system, and then it sort of survived a $60 billion collapse of these systems which really gives you a lot of confidence in its robustness. Would I have expected the whole system to have survived? I don't know. Um, it, nevertheless, it did. Um, with Polkadot, they just sort of launched their full interoperability system in the bear market. One of their biggest challenges is the most, all of the TVL in Polkadot actually exists in EVM chains, mm -hmm. and there's no integration between their interoperability protocol and their EVM chains yet. As a result, most of the interoperability in Polkadot actually flows over other protocols. Um, we just launched, and then like this year, the, thanks to the Composable team, there's IBC connectivity to Polkadot. Mm -hmm. So in some senses, Polkadot is part of Cosmos. Um, so I think like one of the realities of Polkadot is, is it's a very sophisticated system, um, but it has experienced a lot less like truly these like bizarre, extraordinary circumstances um, than the Cosmos system. And so, you know, in many ways, like there's a lot to like about it. There's a lot of ways in which Polkadot resembles like roll-ups, it, it re resembles Celestia. Um, but I do think that there is, that for the most demanding users right now, uh, Cosmos represents a more ba battle-tested solution. So the idea of Somalia finance has been this idea that one of, like, so my view of interoperability is most people still think of interoperability as like, oh, like I bridge my tokens, I use an app. Mm -hmm. Okay, like we have all of these, you know, we have DEXs, we have lending protocols on different chains. And really to me, I wanted to model a different form of interoperability. A form of interoperability where you're taking the strengths of one chain and one ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we have Cosmos chains, they, they're cheap, they have governance, um, they have built-in DAOs, they have bridging protocols, um, and combine it with the strengths of another protocol like e ETH and EVM. The second thing is I really love DeFi. I think DeFi is why we build blockchains. Um, I think DeFi can be hard to use, et cetera. But one of the things that I would observe is I saw that like DeFi was just going to get more and more complicated over time, which it has. And so DeFi summer, you know, you put your money in compound, you earn comp rewards, you put your money in, in Uniswap pools, you would get, you know, various forms of, of LP rewards. It was very accessible, even playing field open to everyone. But as the protocols have become more serious, as you've seen like Compound V2, Aave V3, uh, uh, Uniswap V3, the general trend is more and more complex financial positions that could be represented, but it gets less and less accessible to the everyday user. Mm -hmm. And so what Sommelier wants to do is make it so that users are essentially still providing liquidity, still providing capital. Anyone can provide capital into DeFi protocols but they don't have to deal with the complexities of you know, rebalancing positions and all this stuff. So we have a product called Fraximal on, uh, on Sommelier, and Fraximal is an automatic rebalancing uh, between different Frax lending pools. So rather than a user having to monitor every day, check prices, rebalance, and now we're like the fifth largest lender on Frax's lending pools, and it's already having an impact by making um, the borrow rate like the amount you have to pay to borrow on the Frax lending pool, more predictable and lower um, because you have this automatic rebalancing. And in the same way, like, you know, there's actually tremendous amounts of yield to be made on Uni V3, but it's completely inaccessible to most users, and, you know, Sommelier makes that accessible. And so there are multi platforms which have much larger TVL, like, for example, Beyond Finance or Vichy Finance, how are you different from those ones? Our yields are much higher. Why our TVLs are not higher is not, uh, something of a mystery. Um, like, uh, Yearn's ETH product returns about 3.5% yield on ETH. Uh, our ETH project 
uh, your return is 9% um, and would scale to bigger than the urine, uh, urine product. So, you know, it's just been, it's growing in this market is a struggle. Um, you have a lot of capital that was kind of deployed during the bull market and not really been touched, even though yields have been fine. You have a lot of fear. Um, Civilier is a new product and, uh, you know, it's not that new anymore, but it's a new product. Uh, and there's a lot of fear in this market as well. Um, and those are, those are the challenges for growing. But, you know, TVL is up 40% this month. And your most popular product is probably uh, real cereal vault? Yeah, your real yield ETH, yeah. yeah. So can you tell more about it? So real yield ETH is a multi-strategy vault that is, just optimizes your ETH denominated yields. So, you know, Initially, when it started out, it sort of was betting, it, it, it bet on uh, Coinbase ETH coming to fair market value after the, after the withdrawals were enabled, and that was very successful and profitable for the people in there. Um, then we pivoted into a wrap stake, leverage wrap stake ETH, a bunch of leverage staking strategies. Um, and now, when we're uh, in the market conditions right now, the most profitable place to be is uh, providing uh, liquidity on. Uh, Providing liquidity on uh, uh, providing liquidity on Uni V3 for a bunch of liquid staking pairs. So about half the strategy is doing that. Half the strategy is uh, uh, is wrap staking is uh, is leverage staking. Mm -hmm. um, and so unlike any other product, like why is why is our yield nine percent and urine's is three percent? The reason our yields are much higher is because urine's product doesn't adapt to market conditions. If you know. It, the yields will go down and it'll just keep doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Some strategies rebalance and say, oh, okay, yields are coming down on our leverage staking. We're going to do Uni V3. Um, we can add new adapters and new solutions as these things go on. So you got the third party strategy providers for the new product? Yeah. Um, our t most successful strategies are by two third party strategy providers. One is called Seven Cs and the other one is called Define Logic Labs. And uh, what is uh, somebody at Seven Labs? So, like everybody can start with their own vault. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, we right now there's a governance process mm -hmm. behind the vaults. Um, I mean, we really want the Sommelier brand to kind of stand for a level of trust. Um, so we do do you know vetting the Sommelier DAO does vet strategies and strategists kind of before they come onto the platform. Um, and, you know, as a practical matter, the DAO has, typically has to invest a lot of tokens and incentives, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, to like kind of grow these strategies. So we do want to, and we want to have a brand that sort of is synonymous with trust. And as well, you recently partnered with Exolab to allow for new chains uh, to bring yeah. uh, uh, like Arbitrum Nova. So yeah. can you tell more about this and what chains are the next one? I mean, I think that the point of, Sommelier's point of view is we want to make these vaults available everywhere. Um, right now, we've just been on ETH L1, but with our Axelar partnership, um, we're able to use Axelar's generalized message passing system mm -hmm. to, draw, to drive vaults on a variety of different chains. So wait, we built our own bridge two years ago for Ethereum, um, but now the number of EVM chains has expanded enormously, and now we want to focus on these. We have institutional users of, of existing Sommelier products. We have family offices, funds that are, that are you know, deploying capital into these things. Um, you know, there's a, you know, so they could be running these strategies themselves um, in many ways, but you know, there are advantages. There's composability advantages. We, wanna, we really want to find new use cases for real yield ETH. We want people to be able to do, um, we want people to be able to use them in the same way you like we use a liquid staking token. In North America, fear is still the dominant feeling, but there is enthusiasm in Europe and Asia for institutional adoption. Mm -hmm. And where are most of your users uh, uh, from these regions? All over the world. Not, North, not very much North America, but a lot of Europe and Asia. And uh, as well on your profile, it's written uh, that you're a supporter of Euro L Network on a move language. So yeah. can you tell about this new blockchain? Um, um, I'm not, well, 
I'm very excited about Move. I think it's like one of the most promising smart contract languages. Um, and you know, you see, you saw all these massive venture funded Move chains, mm -hmm. and we tried to do a more with Zero L as an attempt to build a more community oriented uh, mm -hmm. environment. But at the same time, like the Move application layer is moving very slowly. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, it's a project, it's, it's sort of evolving on its own now. And is it more like experimental stuff for you? Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, so like I was involved in a lot of the early Cosmos and proof of staking development. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that there's a lot of, like the current form of proof of stake, um, like uh, John Charbonneau gave this talk at Modular Summit about, you know, Essentially, like proof of stake in its current form is not really working out the way anyone intended, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of need to innovate um, about how do you how do validators join the network? What are the mechanism? What is like the mechanism? The sort of like oh, you get coins delegated and then you get into the validator. So it's just like a little bit of a place to like experiment with new ideas. And do you invest yourself in many altcoins? Um, yeah, I do a lot of especially Cosmos investing. Share any of your latest investments? Oh, uh, I mean, it's, none of this is financial advice, um, you know. But uh, I am. What am I? What, what's new that I'm excited about? Um, I mean, I actually think like probably the most exciting thing that's happening right now is this whole Osmosis 2.0 thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the. Like, I, I view the sort of, like, next wave of Cosmos to come from uh, uh, Osmosis, like, sort of getting its mojo back, the improvements to the protocol and the improvements and to that protocol providing a lot of new opportunities. I think other pieces that are going to be, that are relevant are, like, new large cap assets like Wormhole and Barachain and Celestia launching in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge opportunity. There's just there's a, there we're just on the cusp of like a huge renewal of energy in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And what's the next trend so do you see for the next one two years? The next one to two years. I mean that's almost well. I think the other thing that I think is, I think the big challenge for DeFi right now is all of the growth of DeFi, Similia included, is very much driven by Ethereum staking yield. I think Ethereum staking yield will be like fully integrated in the ecosystem in about six months to a year. There has to be something new that replaces it. Mm -hmm. And what that new thing is, I think, is a big mystery. So you plan to, uh, to release some other products in the future? This yeah, we, I would like to find ways of, you know, whether it's real world asset cash flow or mm -hmm. other things, bringing them online. And can you share as well some upcoming plans uh, for Somalia? Um, I think the most exciting thing is getting real yield ETH integrated into more protocols. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have anything to announce yet, but like I would like to get lending markets, uh, you know, things like Pendle, et cetera, derivatives markets, everything working on real yield ETH as soon as possible. Thank you for such interesting conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>